No, is it recording? Okay. Bye, Mommy. Bye. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nuala Nikrohora and I'm going to read my story Peach, which features in the winter 2011 issue of Prairie Schooner. A pregnant woman was getting drunk in the back lounge. I could see her through the hatch from where I sat at the bar. She was drinking and crying, sitting on the red velveteen couch alone. Chuffy wiped glasses, poured another Sidona for me and served the few other customers. He looked over at the woman and then nodded in my direction as a way of asking if I had seen her. I shrugged to indicate that I had and watched her. She looked healthy and out of place. We never got many women in the cova, especially ones we didn't know. Most of us were regulars, bent out of shape by loneliness. We welcomed any intrusion. The woman sobbed loudly and wrapped her hands around her belly like it was a beach ball she was about to throw. Her head drooped forward and I could see tears plashing down her shirt. I wondered what was wrong with her. Maybe, I thought, the baby's father had walked out. Maybe, like most of us, the rough magic of her childhood haunted her and she hoped for a better life for her kid. Or maybe she didn't want the child at all. Chuffy walked over and dropped a box of tissues onto her table. She looked up, startled. He put his hand on her shoulder. You should think about calling it a night, he said. There's no point. Drinking for two is not really the thing, you know that. The woman grimaced. It's too late, she said. He's already gone. I was at the corporation market buying fish for my Friday night kedgeree when I saw Chuffy trundling down one of the cluttered aisles opposite me. I slotted my fingers inside my lips to whistle, but at that moment he turned and spoke to a woman walking beside him. Looking at her long hair and the curved egg of her stomach, I realised it was the crying woman from the bar. I pulled my fingers from my mouth and stared. Chuffy's head dipped close to hers to hear whatever it was she had said in reply to him. They looked intimate and familiar, and I was surprised to find that I felt put out. I watched Chuffy in the cova that evening, wondering whether to ask about the woman. Chuffy was fatherly, avuncular even, and he was growing old in that Irish way. The nose and chin sloping towards each other, the skewed dark pools of his eyes getting lost in his face. I wanted to quiz him about how well he knew the woman if he really knew her, but my curiosity baffled me, so I didn't ask. It's dead tonight, I said, looking around at the mostly empty tables. I might close soon and be damned, Chuffy said, flicking the remote at the television and talking over his shoulder to me. Were you here earlier? I said. I came in at six. Waste of bloody time. I got a nice bit of smoked haddock at Stoney's stall today, I said. Uh, he had nothing left by the time I got there. Another bloody waste of time. Drink that back there, Dominic. I'm going to close her up, Chuffy said, flicking the lights behind the bar to let people know he was shutting for the evening. There was a commotion going on around the phone box at the end of my road. I strolled past and surveyed the huddle of heads in the group that had gathered. One or two people were looking up and down the street as if searching for answers or an escape. There was someone lying on the ground, half in and half out of the phone box. The receiver was dangling. It was the woman from the pub. Maud, a man said. Maud, can you hear me? I knelt down. She's pregnant, I said. Not anymore, she's not, the man said and stood up. You know her? Ah, not really. She used to work in Creven's shop. Her name is Maud, Maud Peach. The man shrugged and walked away. Maud opened her eyes and looked at me. I checked her over and put my hand under her head. She wasn't cut or bleeding that I could see. You'll be okay, I said, no damage done. Better before you're twice married and once a widow. She smiled and I helped her to, 
I helped her to sit. I'm a friend of Chuffy's from the Cova. I'm Dominic. Can you get up, Maud? My arm hurts. I think I fainted. She hung her head and moaned. I helped her to her feet and brought her to rest on a low garden wall. Her jewellery was optimistic, I noticed. Almost childish. An orange plastic bangle and a strand of multicoloured wooden beads. I'll ring for an ambulance, I said. Don't. Just take me home. At Maud's front door, a smoke-coloured cat with white feet brushed around my legs and pushed its torso into my shins. I half kicked it away, being careful not to hurt it. Your cat? I asked Maud, while she unlocked the door. No, that's Chicago. He belongs to my neighbour. She shook her foot at him. Psst, Chicago, psst, get lost. Chicago ran through Maud's legs into the hall. He looked up at us. I should stop feeding him, she said. There was a tension to the way Maud occupied her rooms. Even though she had invited me to come to her house, I could tell that her routine was upset in a way that she did not altogether welcome. She was straining to be hospitable, and I felt like that she expected me to entertain her, but didn't trust me to succeed. It made me uncomfortable. I hadn't seen her since I left her to the door the day she fell. How are you since, I said. Grand now, not a bother. Will I open the wine, I said, pointing at the bottle I had brought. Sure, I'll get a couple of glasses. None for me, I'll have water. Oh, she said. Drinking gets in the way of my suffering. I laughed to kill the sorry weight of the comment. Maud smiled but looked unsure. She uncorked the wine, held it up to her nose and sniffed deep into the neck of the bottle. It covers mine, she said. There was a callow bright oil cloth on her table. It was yellow with cerise hibiscus flowers. An orchid propped in a milk bottle spilled orange dust from its stamen onto the tablecloth. The orchid seemed to spray its hot smell into the room. A bird cage on a stand was parked in one corner. I looked in at a budgie. He was a startling, fake looking blue. Wow, he's attractive. This is Droopy, Maud said. He's such a little pet. She laughed and flicked her fingers at the bird. Hello, beautiful Droopy. Hello, boy, she said. She peeped and trilled at him before putting on a CD and sitting opposite me at the table, her back straight. The queen of an overblown love song filled the room. Maud was beautifully old-fashioned, I thought, with her long hair and simple t-shirt, like something from a 1970s film. Her lips were aristocratically full and she had the kind of tail-ended hair that I always wanted to gather in handfuls and press to my face. I guessed, by the tense way she held herself, that she spent a lot of time on her own. I wanted to ask about her baby, but couldn't seem to get the words to form right. I thought that it must have died, and I didn't want to be nosy or insensitive. She looked different on the other side of pregnancy. Her cheeks were less fleshy. She was milk pale, and lethargy oozed off her, despite her nervousness. I had an urge to make things better for her, to help in some way by saying something that would heal her a little. But she was one of those chatless people, the kind that doesn't feel the need to talk unless you make the conversation happen for them. And anyway, I didn't have a clue what I should say. Ah, I'll have a glass of wine, I said, suddenly feeling the need for that prop. Lovely, Maud said. She looked brighter as she got up to get me a glass. The wine had a soapy aftertaste, but I liked it. We didn't talk much, but sat listening to the music. When we had finished the bottle of wine, I felt like a previous version of myself. Someone more interested in things, more able, 